Hey, what's up? This is Mike from Gamblers. I'm here with my very good friend, Damian Napoli. Uh, we're at Infinity Records in Massapequa Park, and um, the main reason I wanted to have Damian uh, here in this, in this video with us, uh, we just got stocked in this store. Uh, you know, our, our records on the shelves, they got some, uh, some posters hanging up, and um, you know, it's really special because like Looney Tunes, this is a, another local retailer that, that's been supporting us. And in this town in particular, Massapequa, Massapequa Park, this is, you know, where I'm from, where some of the other guys in the band, Johnny, Brian are from. Uh, and this is a place that we went to as kids. Um, and Damien over here, <laughs> when we were kids, was like the cool record store employee, kind of like the high fidelity character, except in real life and much cooler. Uh, and his opinion, was basically like God's word to to us and to our friends. I don't know if like I've ever said that, but that was kind of, you know, I mean, you know, we really looked up to you. I still do look up to you, but especially back then, it was like, you know, those are those important figures in your life. Uh, and Damien has, has been that for me, uh, you know, going back 15, 20 years at this point. And you know, another thing that's that's important is, is Damien was actually at Gambler's first show and he took me aside afterwards and he, you know, because I've been known to be in, involved in a bunch of different projects, different genres, hip hop, electronic, different rock bands. And he was like, I think you really have something here and I think you should focus on it. Um, and obviously I have focused on it and it's just amazing that these years later, you know, his words kind of rang true. I focused on the band and now we're in the store that I used to come and and uh, probably annoy Damien when, <laughs> when we were uh, kids. You guys, you guys are great. Like uh, you always um, were inquisitive, but like honest, you know what I mean? Like you were thirsty for hearing about different music or just talking about what you guys were you know, doing back then with, you know, your early projects. And uh, yeah, so I just always have kind of like kept a watchful eye, you know, like and try to be a good guidance when I talk to you. And um, yeah, I, going to that show at Beery's, it was kind of impromptu. I was leaving um, around the time my grandfather died. So it was uh, one of his wakes and I kind of just went to get out of the house. And I saw you were playing Beery's and I was like, it's the debut thing, I gotta go down. And I didn't really have any knowledge of the music or anything. I just kind of went blind just to see you, see Tommy, see everyone, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I felt it right away that this was like, this was, this was it. This is what you guys should focus on because it just, it, it's special. And it still is. I'm so proud that it's in stores and that you, you know, you're on the radio and stuff. It's amazing. Thanks, man. I mean, like it's, it's still taking some getting used to, um, you know, it's weird. It's always like the the journey is like the thing rather than the end goal so even like now where you know like you mentioned we are on the radio and we are in stores it's like all right what's that next thing it's weird how your mind works like that but uh none of that would have been possible if you know again you you hadn't kind of um just been that influence and and you know that older brother type and uh just can't thank you enough for nah, that man, and i love you i love you too man so um you know as much as you're comfortable with like what's kind of like your background as far as just for people to know this store and, and your involvement you're 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 heavily involved with with music in in a lot of different ways but uh you know as, as much as you're kind of comfortable talking about okay so uh yeah i started working here probably like 2004 um i was a customer and just like coming to long island around 2002 uh, and I was looking for a place to find music and this place was the only real true record store and it, it kind of still tr rings true really is like a true school record store experience um, So yeah, I worked here and, and you know learned even more about you know records just by being here um, And then meeting other people producers and other things. Um, I've worked in music in different capacities promotions um, And I do uh, you know scout a and R work um, and I also do uh, archive work as well, uh, looking for collections around the country, records. Um, so I left the store here a few years ago, but I still, is always burned bright in me. So that's kind of my path too. Yeah, and, and you, you mentioned some of the A&R stuff that you've done. How has that, because um, th this is like gonna be really interesting for people who, who, who are gonna see this and, and 
like want to kind of see the the inside baseball of, of how that stuff works because I mean I can't even really speak to that as far as A and R goes. Like how is how has that process kind of like changed and evolved over the years? Where you know especially now in a time where there's no concerts or anything like that, it's sort of I guess all online or would would that be is that sort of like rushing the judgment or how how would you define the process now? Um, I think. Uh... It's funny, like I was resistant to those memes, let's say, you know, a lot of A&Rs became people who just looked on MySpace profiles uh, like 10, 15 years ago, right? And um, and so it's evolved from that. That was kind of like a joke to me, but now you, you kind of have to do, you know, I do a lot of responding to like artists just through Instagram, like that's the closest you could get. Right. You know what I mean? Like you're circumventing that process of dealing with like, the chain of trying to get through a secretary and someone else, you, you know, a lot of these artists that are fresh, um, they're, they're dealing directly with their fans. So you could actually, you know, if you love music, you could also, you know, respond as a fan of the music and then also inquire about what they're looking to do with their career. Right. Well, so it has changed in that way. And like, I, I haven't really taken too many meetings in the past year with the, with Zoom. I still am more of a phone guy and, and I, I still enjoy a little more tactile, tangible conversation. I'm the same way. Yeah. I still think the phone call is is king. You know, it's funny. Like I had a situation I, the other day where just going back and forth, even on email, like sometimes things could get lost in the shuffle or like tone could be taken the wrong way. And I was going back like five or six emails and then I was like, this is stupid. I picked up the phone. I'm like, hey, what, what's going on? And like within 30 seconds, everything was fine yeah, yeah you know it's like but i don't know some people are just like afraid of the phone now it's kind of weird yeah i mean i still have struggles in that with trying to get artists like it's hard to get an artist to send you a bio yeah. sometimes it's hard to get because like at the same time you're using a platform that a lot of other people could use to try to get to these artists um sometimes they're a little wary so sometimes the, the people have a, like a, they're they're at an arm's length still right. but um but yeah, it's still a useful technology, and I, I think we're going to get to a point where, you know, especially seeing bands, I mean, like, if, if you see someone or hear someone's music, you can still probably set up a showcase for them. You know what I mean? It just has to be a different protocol. As much as you can speak to, to what you do as far as the collecting side, um, okay. break that down for us a little bit. So yeah, so I, I you know, I've met various people um, throughout uh, my digging around the country and also just, you know, musical knowledge or whatever. And um, so I've accrued different contacts and different clients. And one of the clients I deal with has um, a huge record collection, one of the world's largest. So, you know, I look out for him and look out for things around the country. I've traveled, you know, it's I've been very grateful that before the pandemic was able to see the country um, in, in the way it was before. And I really cherish those digging stories and the people I met, you know, I'm, I think that I think the people around me who who see the passion in me about this, like you know, it comes from like the truest of places. Like it's not, there's no fake and there's no weekend warrior here. It's like this is who I am. This is what I do. Yeah, and I, I mean, I could you know apply that to like the, the artist side. It's just like you could tell who's like who's a weekend warrior or who's like you know for real because I mean we were talking on the phone. Like if you're in this industry for like any of the you know kind of bs things like money or, or whatever like you're wasting your time you might as well you know go be a you know venture capitalist or something i wouldn't even know how to start doing that but <laughs> like yeah no it's interesting um what's your kind of take on the whole like long island music scene you know this is a question that a lot of people have have kind of different responses to um but like you uh, frankly being someone that i whose opinion i respect i'm curious to kind of like get your take on the whole thing um you know there was a period i guess post strokes let's say and then where there were bands that were trying to be something they weren't geographically and that kind of went through the early 2000s until like some of the bands in the emo scene out here and the post hardcore scene kind of picked up nationally um, but then a lot of people lost their own identities through that and um, I think now uh, there's different pockets out here of really cool music and different genres um, there's not, maybe not enough cohesion I'd like to see more of a cohesive community with it as opposed to just like people sh 
just kind of shine in. But at least more people are saying the band's from out here. As opposed to saying, you know, well, two of our members are from Queens, so we'll say we're from the city. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't work all the time, because it's not, it, it comes, eventually the veil is lifted. You know what I mean? Like, eventually it's gonna come out, and you're better off just being honest with people, and honest with the fan base, too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I feel there's a lot of uh, potential out here. There's always people doing their thing out here uh, musically. It's just a matter of how to present it in a way where it's like a viable scene. There used to be maybe 60 record stores or more, you know, 25, 30 years ago out here. And it's, it's coming back. But like that sense of community, there's a huge music scene out here in terms of like what people have listened to the past 50 years, um, who's been from here from the past, like Lou Reed, a perfect example. A lot of people don't even know that. Yeah, and he used to write under different names for like a company I heard called Pickwick, like writing songs about like hot rods and stuff before he was famous and he was in like various little things. So yeah, like a lot of people um, came from here and it, there's an energy here that people should tap into, I feel because of that, especially um, also in the hip hop scene. I mean, I, something I've always wanted is I feel there should be a Long Island Hall of Fame for hip hop, uh, just because how many people are from here and how influential they resonated through the world through hip hop. Some of the biggest, like most influential uh, figures in hip hop. It's funny you mentioned the whole thing about like saying you're from Long Island or saying like, oh, two of our guys are from Queens. Like people know who follow this band, like, we were based in Williamsburg for like five years because the majority of the band was, you know, in Brooklyn and, and one guy was in Queens. But anyway, uh, our since our original lineup kind of broke up, um, the sort of, I hate to use the word branding, but the sort of like, all right, where are we from thing changed. Because um, I wanted to be real with people. And also I had a conversation with our team when we were getting ready to like, you know, start releasing everything related to Small World. And they're like, honestly, say you're from Long Island. Because, <laughs> like, who the hell wants to hear from another, like, band from Brooklyn? Who gives a shit? You know, and it's kind of true. It's like, it's something different. Um, not to you or I, but, you know, to people in general. Like, okay, wow, so another band from Brooklyn. Like, it's just, to me, it, to, to, to my team, it kind of made sense. And it's, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that, because I definitely agree. You hear the too. If you listen to the record, you hear you hear your perspective from being out here. You, know, you also have yeah. strong ties in the city, you know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, I don't look at that as like, you're oh, like you're coming from a bridge and tunnel perspective or right. something, you know what I mean? Like you have family roots in the city yeah. and you know, real deal stuff. And to be from out here, you have a good perspective with, with, with I think seeing the city for what it is and understanding your experience living here. What's your, kind of take on um, everything that, you know, we ran into each other at a, at a uh, Black Lives Matter protest uh, over the summer um, that happened in your hometown. Well, it went through it went through that area. Yeah. Um, to me, I that was something that was because speaking about Long Island, like a lot of it, you know, we're generally considered to be a wildly ignorant place. And in a lot of ways, that's obviously true. Um, but I think what we saw over the summer as far as the protests are concerned, was uh, a nice breath of fresh air. Um, I'm wondering, because from, from my perspective, I had obviously never seen anything like that out here. What, what was your take on it, especially being from that exact area? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, it's funny, like that video that popped up about the people in Merrick. Mm -hmm. um, I'm originally from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and uh, I've moved around the island, but I stayed in Belmore for, I've been there, I was there about 16 years. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was the longest I've lived in one place out here, and so yeah, I did was my you know home, and uh, yeah, this, this, I saw I recognized some of those people spitting that venom, uh, you know, from the deli, from walking around, you know, like wow, these are people around me, like it's shocking. So we should we should just clarify the 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 reason that there became like a big BLM protest in that area was because there was this viral video that happened of you know on some corner it was yeah, like five corner. to ten people it was yeah, like it wasn't, it's very small yeah and they were saying a bunch of like i, I guess racist stuff i don't remember the yeah, exact the video people showed up in force because of that as a response exactly so with that was beautiful it to was. see it was. um and and uh yeah i mean I, I i i walked out i had this be a part of 
you know, at least witnessing it and, and supporting. Uh, but it was scary at some points. Yeah, there were, you know, choppers around and all of a sudden on my street, I checked my cameras, we were in the house and there was like a line of uh, police officers with shotguns walking, just dead walking in the center of my street, walking by my house, like seven or eight of them with shotguns just walk. I was like, what's going on here? You know, this is, this is an outlandish response, you know, to that. And look what just happened recently, you know, like look at that response, yeah, uh, no, look at the difference. When you when you see uh, the difference, it's uh, it's pretty hard to to argue. Um, see, but the other thing I feel that you have uh, an advantage, not an advantage, but just like a unique perspective too, is understanding the segregation out here, the history of it out in Long Island, um, and I'm sure that'll be informed in your writing and future writing, understanding the disparities that have been out here for a very long time, um, from the way things were built out here to just going even back to, you know, the old Patriots, like the towns that are next to some of the richest towns or some of the poorest, because that's where the help lived back then. And it's kind of like stayed the same if you think about it. And, and like, there's some real disparities that you just can visually see without even talking to people that are just a shame and that it's uh, hopefully will change. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, and it's funny too because some of my friends kind of they they poke me and they, you know they're like, oh, you're the Long Island guy, and it's like, not really. I'm just I'm just being honest. <laughs> you know, like I'm not gonna tell you I'm from Brooklyn. I am not from Brooklyn, uh, so I'm not gonna lie to you. A, and then B, to your point, you know, and I, I spoke about this in, a, in probably our biggest piece of press um, that that we've gotten national press or, of pop matters, you know. I, I said it's like Long Island is, you know, you, you peel back the layers of the onion and you have, you know, what you're talking about. Then you have the opioid crisis, uh, you know, then you have, you know, things like this finding bodies, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Long Island serial killer. Sure, so it's like it. it's not, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, a freaking uh perfect and uh, I'm blanking on the name, Pleasantville or something like that. You know, it's like a lot of times it's a, it's a little creepier what's beyond the surface than, than what meets the eye. You know, like a, like a horror movie where you're, you don't necessarily see the monster. Um, that's kind of my take on it. And, and to your point, yeah, it is reflected in, in the writing and that's kind of informs a lot of the sort of like paranoia of my lyrics, I think. Um, at least that's, that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, but yeah, man, like I said, we I wanted to talk to you. I wanted to bring you in because, uh, well, <laughs> you're actually the reason that we're, we're in the store. <laughs> I don't know if we, we want to touch on that a little bit. <laughs> well, you, I'll just say, you, I think it was a good timing. Uh, yeah, sure. No, it was. And I actually go back with Corey. Um, I remember when he started working here now, he's, uh, and he started just as I was leaving. Uh, right. I left. Which was, how long ago was that now? Uh, 2011 I left. So yeah, it's, this May would be Is 10 years. Long? Yeah, 10 years I'm gone no. from here. Yeah. It doesn't feel that. Long. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I know. But yeah, it's it's great. It's great that they're still here too. Definitely through the pandemic. I mean, it's yeah. You know, the community no. came together. Or our community helped them out, or came and supported them, and you know that's important too, is to have people in your microcosm of your world, like the economy around you is important to survive. You need that. I've always said like about this town in particular, you know, the two real pieces of culture that we have to, to sort of offer is this place and the coffee shop, Massapequa well, Perk. It's funny, I was thinking about that today. I went there today and, mm. uh, you know, I, I knew Lucky pretty well as, as did you yeah. and uh, and even Jack. and But like, yeah. they were, they were, um, they were one of the first, like, when I say craft, it's a, you know, trendy word or whatever, but right. like they were the first, one of the first stores around here and in Nassau County, I feel at the time to like well, uh, show real care on what they were doing. You know what I mean? And then that was before, this town was not like that. And that happened and it, it kind of resonated a little more. If you go through this town now, it's a lot different. And I think a lot of the other towns around here uh, that resonated with them too. They needed a coffee shop like that, you know what I mean? But they truly had like uniqueness in that way and, and you see it in the town now. And Lucky, uh, the guy who, uh, you know, for people that want to know, we're talking about a coffee shop that's across the street, which, we, you know, we also put on the same 
a similar level as far as cultural importance. It sounds funny talking about <laughs> cultural know. importance no, of Massapequa. Just means, you know, I, <laughs> no, but you know, if you got if you were there, yeah. and knew them and knew how much love well, they put see, into yeah. it, just like here, just how much love they put into this store. Yeah, you and lucky, I mean? lucky the former owner and Jack who who worked the counter. Neither of them are with us anymore, unfortunately. Um, but they, you know, they were also they they put me. Uh, I was one of the first like live performers when they had music. Lucky yeah. was trying out music in the beginning. Tom Moran too. So I mean, yeah, man. He was yeah. like, you could see that he was happy. He was glowing yeah. about carrying your product, carrying Tom's. You know, just being just being a place of openness. Yeah, yeah. he was a good dude. Yeah. So so, what's on your radar now? Like, what do you have going on? What's getting you excited about about twenty twenty one? If anything, <laughs> just in general. Uh, but, you know, I, I have optimism for this year. I mean, you know, I have some resignation about our situation. Uh, I, you know, that that I think we all need to have some sort of sobering thought about. Like, this is here. Yeah. We're dealing with this. We're gonna have to deal with it still. Um, it's not like something that's gonna vanish. So, uh, yeah. so through that, trying to adapt. You know, which everyone has been trying to do the past year. But like, I think you need to like really take it and put into action this year. Um, and and I'm really uh, and I've done it this year whole year too, uh, especially with rap music. The the perspective of 2020 in writing in music, you know, is uh, enormous. There was there was a lot that was said in the past year if you looked for it. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that perspective kind of bears more fruit, you know, not necessarily through pain, but just. Uh, and not necessarily in America too. Like, um, I'm really excited about music from Africa right now. Um, there's a lot going on there um, that's like f truly exciting uh, that that I think will bear fruit in, in music in the next couple of years. So uh, that's that's what I'm really looking forward to too. Music from around the world's response to this. I'm gonna hit you up for some uh, some links and some some tips on that because that sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, well, dude, thank you so much. Um, like I said, we're we're here, Infinity Records, Massapequa Park. Uh, this is Damian Napoli. Uh, he was he was the our source of uh, influence, and he was the he 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 is uh, still a very important source of influence for me and a lot of our friends that we grew up with. And uh, it's only right that that we um, we chatted with him today because you know this was this was his home for a while as yeah. far as far as uh work and music is concerned and um we're really we feel really special to, to be in this store and uh we we thank them very much uh and yeah thank you man you're welcome <laughs>